I'm guessing most, a lot of people in here know who Nancy Ross Hugo is, but just in case. She has been living and gardening and writing in Ashland and Hanover County since 1997. She is the author of five books, including Remarkable Trees of Virginia, Seeing Trees, and Trees Up Close, and counts it among the best decisions she and her husband ever made to buy their first home in Ashland on Maple Street. Her topic tonight is One, wild, one Mile Wide, the history and natural beauty of the Ashland Trolley Line. Yeah. Um, I first have to start with a disclaimer because here I am speaking for the Ashland Museum and I um, am not a historian, not even close. I have a little bit even date challenged. Um, I know my children's birth dates and that's about all. <laughs> um, but I have two qualifications for doing this program. One is I think I'm the biggest fan of the Ashland Trolley Line. I've been walking it for 21 years, almost every day. Every day I'm home, I walk it. Um, and the other one is that in 2000, I did a lot of research about the trolley line. I was working on an Ashland Women's Club paper, which everybody knows you work very hard on that. Um, and so I wrote a paper at that time called One Mile Wild. And where is Betty LaPlace? She's here. Oh, I was going to say, Betty LaPlace asked me, I thought if Betty didn't come here after she got me into this. <laughs> Betty asked me if I would read that paper to this group. I said, sure, no problem. Well, then I went and looked at the paper and there were so many dated things in it and so much new information and I thought, oh, can't just do that. So anyway, I ended up trying to blend that paper into a PowerPoint presentation. Have no idea how this is gonna work. Um, I hope it works and we'll just see. But most of it is, I'm going to be reading to you uh, for a couple reasons. It is a paper and the other is I want to get the facts straight. Um, and I think if I stay on script, I'll do a better job of that. Um, let's see, other things. I wanted to tell you what my sources were. Um, th those of y'all who are sitting on that table are sitting on lots of the things I read. Um, <laughs> Rails in Richmond uh, by Carlton McKinney, I'm going to refer to over and over. It's a book from our library here that is on, uh, you can't check it out, but it's in the, uh, what is it, Retro. reference section. Um, there's something called Capital Traction Quarterly that is a railroad magazine. And some, they published something about the trolley line in 1966 that was just fabulous. If you told me in my 20s I would want to be reading any such thing, I'd have said you're crazy, but it was wonderful. Um, some retrospective articles in the uh, Herald Progress, one in the Times Dispatch that was great, Roseanne's book, Roseanne's Shelf has a chapter or at least a section on the trolley lines and trains. Um, and what else? My own interviews in 2000, I interviewed a lot, a fair number of people who had ridden the trolley. And a fair number of them are gone now, which is sort of, that's another reason I'm sort of glad to be sharing this history. It is so incredibly interesting. And there are actually three chapters. The first is the electric trains, second is the trolleys, and the third is the greenway. And we'll try to talk about all of them. So uh, I'm so worried. I'm so sorry you're not sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, the first thing is where is it? And the other thing I am not is a cartographer. <laughs> I put south up at the top. <laughs> My husband looked at this and went, why is south at the top? I said, well, that's the way I picture it. So anyway, but here's where it is. This, it, these are the railroad tracks headed south out of Ashland. Okay, that's the way it works in my head. I don't know why. Uh, Gua there, here's the Ash Kick Road uh, intersection, Guathme Church Road intersection. The trolley line trail is here. Uh, where is Donna? The White Way is, this is their house. It's a big Victorian back there. This is my house. This is Guathme Ch uh, Church. I'm going to talk later about some of this. This is where the new 
uh, concrete, uh, help me, boardwalk is going to be, is where this little red area is. This is the troublesome problem right now. This is where there's a gate and it's hard to keep going. I'll talk more about that later. But do you understand where it is? It's up to you. Okay, okay. Um, the other important thing is that even though I titled my paper One Mile Wild or One Wild Mile, it got interpreted both ways, um, it's really only a half a mile. <laughs> but it sounded so much better to say One Wild Mile. And also, I walk up and back. And so does most everybody else. So it's usually a one mile walk. Okay, so that's where it is. This is the sign you would see if you enter at the south end, which is down at Guathme Church Road. This, now I'm going to move to my paper a little bit. Um, because physically, this is what's so interesting about one of the things that's so interesting. Can you hear me way back there? Ooh. It's so it is elevated. This, you would pretty much never see this scene because I had to crawl down to the bottom to take this picture up there. But it's elevated. Um, at some points, the earthen berm is 25 feet high. And that's above ground level. So you're looking as you walk. And this is one of the things I love about it. You're looking into the middles of the trees. Not, you're not on the same level as the trees. It's very interesting perspective. Um, you can, you, and you're going through a wetland, you've got your head high and your feet dry, but you're walking through a wetland. Most of it's a wetland. Um, so what, when I walk this, I feel like I have the perspective of a person 30 feet tall. <laughs> and this is Stony Run coming through that culvert right there. Um, so my first question about the trolley line was how was it built? It's an enormous berm of soil going through there. And my first answer came from that Carlton McKinney book, Rails in Richmond, and he said that the trolley line, that I'm not gonna, I'm gonna call it the train line at this point, that the line to Richmond had been built, well, I knew it was too, what, too young to have been built by bulldozers, too old to have been built by enslaved people. So how could it have been built? And he said that the, most of the line was built by um, teams of 16 mules working to move the soil. Well, he was still alive at the time I started this research. He's not now, but when I, I just, my mind went crazy over that. Every time I walked it from then on, I was picturing mule teams with 16 mules working on the sides of that berm. And he burst my balloon by saying, well, in your area, there were probably only four mules to attend. <laughs> because it was a little bit harder to maneuver. But anyway, so mules were the answer. And they were pulling uh, scoop shovels. And evidently, that is sort of like a plow, but it's a scoop, and it has handles. And they would dig down, get a scoop of shovel. And this was built shovel full by shovel full of dirt. And then my next question was, where did the dirt come from? If you have ever tried to put one inch of topsoil on a tiny garden, you know that it just, it's like doing it with a thimble. It just takes so much. So nobody really knows, but it probably came from fields in the area, maybe from the white waste field, maybe from my backyard. Maybe that's one reason even today there are huge sort of uh, things that don't look like the normal wetland holding water. I think, oh, that scoop went too deep there. You know, they may have just piled it up right there from the sides and went up 25 feet. But it's an interesting question to me. Um, let's see. What's the other thing that makes this sort of ironic for me is that when they did that, of course, it must have been an ecological catastrophe. You just don't move that much soil without destroying plant and animal habitats. And I think it's sort of ironic that this, is, this area I enjoy so much um, went through this difficult period and it's now 
It's not a pristine place. It's like a comeback place. But it has made a terrific comeback. And it's had 100 years to do it so far. So what traveled this giant earthwork? From 1907 to 1917, what traveled this elevated berm? It's probably not what you think. They weren't the quaint little streetcars that you think of in San Francisco, or the ones that later traveled air trolley line. They were large, heavy electric train cars. The berm we walk on today was built to accommodate high-speed electric trains, <laughs> real trains, only powered by overhead electrical lines called pantographs. That's my new favorite word, pantograph. <laughs> what we now call the trolley line trail was originally part of an ambitious plan by the financier Frank J. Gould to carry freight and passengers from Norfolk to Fredericksburg via Petersburg and Richmond with branches to Tappahannock and points on the Chesapeake Bay. He envisioned this, the Richmond and Chesapeake Bay Railway, as a major artery that would bring fresh produce and seafood from far eastern Virginia to population centers farther east. Only the Richmond to Ashland section of this ambitious railway was ever built, but that portion that was built was really well built. And in fact, if you walk it and think this was so overbuilt for little trolleys, well, it's because it wasn't built for trolleys. It was built for heavy, 39-ton electric train cars. Um, so it's, okay, there are other ways it was built, too, that were different. Let's see, it had gentle slopes, moderate curves, so that the trains could reach top speeds of 90 miles per hour. <laughs> Although no one reports that the cars ever reached such a speed, Frank Tosh, writing in the Capital Traction Quarterly, wrote that there were undocumented accounts of employees who ran one of these at over 80 miles per hour when no passengers were aboard. <laughs> and although they look about the same in a lot of the pictures, you have to really sort of train your eye to know the difference between the electric trains and the trolleys. Um, the cars were different in appearance than the trolleys that came later. And the trolleys came between 1919 and 1938. I'll get that in a minute. Um, oh, actually, hold on. I have, I'll find them. Oh, here. I brought, made these cards for other date challenged people. <laughs> and I take it only if you're date challenged because it'll keep those straight. It's t so important to me to keep the date straight between the electric trains and the trolleys. Okay. Um, all right, so here's how they were different. Gould bought four 55-foot train cars from the St. Louis uh, Car Company, and they were comfortable and luxurious. They resembled Pullman parlor cars with mahogany paneling, high-backed seats, frescoed ceilings, smoking compartments, and vestibules separating the car door from the interior. Uh, McKinney, the author of that book, Rails in Richmond, describes them as having been resplendent in colors of dark green and cream with gold trim. Um, uh, there are some things I'm going to leave out of the paper about how Gould got permission to build this railway because he was going to be in competition with the RFNP. So that was not easy, but he did get permission to do it. Uh, the, it, he invested $994,000 in it, and the first rich train traveled from Richmond to Ashland, October 28, 1907, and it was a 14.8 mile trip. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay. It's hard to imagine how ambitious Gould's plans for the Richmond and Chesapeake Railway Company were. 
Writing in a retrospective piece in the Times-Dispatch, columnist Ray McAllister said that had Gould's project been completed as planned, it would have been the Taj Mahal of transportation. Um, and the part that he did build was a marvel at the time. Okay, the electric trains traveled from Laurel and Broad in Richmond through the city, down what's now Brook Road, passing through what is now the abandoned parking lot of Azalea Mall, through Lakeside, Greenwood, and Elmont to Ashland. All right, that shows the stations. And um, look how many, look how close together, tenth of a mile between Francis Street and McMurdo. That's where, the, that's where it stopped. Okay. Oh, and, Oh, well, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh, well. Um, this, I'll go on to that. This is my favorite picture of all the historic pictures because this is the electric train passing across Wathme Church Road. This is, those are, I know everybody in here, I hate acting like everybody knows everybody, but the White Way, Madonna White Way is here. She owned those tulip poplar trees back there. Her house is right there. And this is Wathme Church Road, and that would be Donna Whiteway's house ba right back there. And here's where it looks, that's it today. So the train, whoops, I forgot I have a tool. The, that's the train is sitting right there. And the trolley line starts, it just goes this way, and that sign is back behind that bush. So I just love those pictures. Okay. Okay. This, when, and when you got to Richmond, oh, uh, this is from uh, Woody Tucker. He, I don't know, I have not seen this anywhere in any publication. And Woody, Woody, where'd you find it? Where's Woody? Oh, oh, well, anyway, um, can you read, the, I love it. This is the schedule of not the trolleys, but the electric trains that preceded the trolleys. And I love it, it says no smoke, no cinders, blah, blah, blah. And it says it doesn't, go, visits all these stops in 35 minutes. Okay. All right. This is the train station at Laurel and Broad. And you can see it had steps going up the front, but the trains came in the back on the second floor, had wonderful little shops on the side. This is where it was. This is, again, not a cartographer. <laughs> But anyway, it's at the intersection of Laurel and Broad, and it faces Broad. I had turned it upside down to show you that, and I went, no, that's not good. <laughs> but anyway, that's where it's. And here's the interesting thing. In 2000, I visited, and it had been covered up by Richmond Glass Company. The guy took me around and showed me the trains came up, came in here, up the second floor. This, you can't really quite see it, but it says colored on this door. It was, the, the door, it was still on the door, white, colored, different uh, restrooms. Okay, so Richmond Glass has covered it up. Well, now, last week, Betsy Hodges took us a group down to VCU, and it's been uncovered. It's fabulous. It's called the Depot. Everything is back. They even have the shops on the sides. It has been beautifully renovated. It's the Center for Creative Economy now, <laughs> run by the cutest little guy, little guy, young man you've ever seen. <laughs> um, this, I love this because 1907, when it first ran Richmond, they have just done an incredible job. This never happens, does it? <laughs> but they uncover it and they bought it for a million dollars and put $6.8 million into it. <laughs> anyway, it's so wonderful. And they even have these nods to its uh, sort of dark past. These are the steps that the uh, African Americans had to come up. They couldn't come up the front steps. These are the other steps. Um, this is the shows how the train came into the second floor, colored waiting room, white waiting room. Anyway, it was a, that's what it was. It also was really well built because those trains were so heavy, the uh, foundation and the beams and everything were, were extra huge. Anyway, 
So, let's see where I am. So, the Ashland Station, where am I? Way less elaborate, but here it is. Um, I like this picture, and I'm going to show you. There's another one. You know, this helps place it because there's is it the Masonic, the Masonic. Lo Lodge. Oh. Sweet, oh, sorry. Sweet Frog would be, Just past sorry, behind there. Yeah. It faced Maple Street, not England Street. And the short side was like that. Yeah, that's what you would have said. Okay, so, and this is going to confuse historians forever because at least three of the books on this subject refer to the fact that the train station stood on the site of the post office. <laughs> <laughs> and for people who are new to Ashland, you may not know, the post office used to be over here where the Wilton building, is it the Wilton yeah. building, is now. Yeah. It's going to confuse them forever. <laughs> so anyway, that's sort of important to know. Okay, let's see where I am. Okay, one of the interesting things about the Ashland Station, um, wait, these, these are generators in the Ashland train station and it supplied uh, electricity for Ashland for three years. And you had to, you could, uh, from, what was it, Hill, do you know? It only went from dusk to 11 o'clock, and then you had no more electricity. With that, but somebody said to me, well, that's all anybody thought they needed it for. That <laughs> so anyway, until later, shortly after that, the town had a new supply of electricity. But these generators in that Ashland train station, which actually served the trains, were Ashland's first source of electricity. Okay. Okay, the same slide again. In addition to passengers, the electric trains that ran between Richmond and Ashland carried a motorman and a conductor. Two cars parked in Ashland overnight, and the first left the station on Maple Street at 5.50 in the morning. <coughs> trains ran hourly all day and into the night. The last train left Ashland for Richmond at 11 o'clock p.m. The last train to Ashland left Richmond at 11.45 p.m. The run, some sources say took 41 minutes. Obviously, uh, the train company was advertising shorter than that. But that's with 19 stops in between. As you might imagine, Ashlanders loved the electric trains. But almost from the day it opened, the Richmond and Chesapeake Bay Railway Company was in trouble. Not only had construction costs been high, but the line had been built in anticipation of long-term travel, passenger and freight. And passenger travel on this little short section between Richmond and Ashland just was not going to pay. Not only that, but the stock market crash of 1907 and the economic depression that followed affected the fortunes of Jay Gould. After completion of the line to Ashland, extension of the electric railway to Tappahannock was to have begun immediately. But just a week before the Ashland line opened, the Knickerbocker Trust in New York collapsed, and Gould, who had an office in New York, cabled his Richmond office to stop further work on the Richmond and Chesapeake Railway line immediately. Not another rail was ever laid to extend the electric ra railway beyond Ashland. And as a result, although the Ashland-Richmond part of the line survived until 1917, the vision of that connecting Eastern Virginia and population centers was dead. I, I find it fascinating that had this continued, we probably wouldn't have even needed I-95. <laughs> yeah. um, and I also think it's so interesting to me that I owe the trolley line to the collapse of the Knickerbocker Trust. <laughs> it's just so funny the way one thing affects another. The last electric train to run between a Richmond and Ashland ran on December 20th, 1917, marking the end of chapter one in the history of the trolley line trail. Chapter two began uh, in 1919, when after purchasing all the assets, of Gould's company for $135,000. Remember, he had invested 994 in it. 
um, two prominent Richmond businessmen and their investors began operating the Richmond Ashland Railway along the tracks that Gould had built. Now, do we want to switch seats? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody need to switch seats? Everybody's okay? Okay, I'm gonna stop worrying about you. you don't, okay. Um, investors in the Richmond and Ashland Railway Company included lots of prominent Ashlanders, including Sarah Wright's father. And up here from the Ashland Museum, we have some of the stock certificates that were issued for those investors. They're perfectly beautiful, gorgeous. Okay. The Richmond Ashland Railway operated not with Gould's heavy luxury train cars. Those had been sold prior to this new company getting the assets, but rather with smaller, lighter, and slower streetcars that had been purchased secondhand from another railway company. I just think it's so interesting that we sort of you know, had this huge ambitious thing and then went back a little bit. They were lower to the ground than the electric train cars had been. And this is important. They ran on 6,000, they ran not on the 6,600 volts of alternating current that Gould's cars had run on, but rather on 600 volts of direct current which made them much less powerful, but cheaper to run. Let's see. That is the trolley. Streetcar service opened from Richmond to Ashland in July of 1919, <laughs> and it continued until 1938. This is a picture of it at Cedar Lane. That's the trolley at Cedar Lane and there was, would have been a generator in that building and a little place for passengers to wait right here. It was these streetcars or trolleys that many Ashlanders remembered riding when I interviewed them in 2000 and when the Herald Progress collected trolley stories in 1986. Sarah Wright, for example, remembered her parents taking her to Richmond to see her first opera on the streetcar, traveling on the Ashland trolley line and she remembers having to leave the mosque early because the last trolley left before Lohengrin was over. <laughs> she remembered her father looking back over his shoulder to try to catch as much of the performance as he could before they had to leave. Um, I think the fare to Richmond was 50 cents, but this is a picture of, I think five cents would get you from one stop to the next. Uh, the Herald Progress reported that Bob Lancaster paid five cents for his regular trips to Ashland from Guathme to attend church and school. And the streetcars were eventually so punctual you could set your clocks by them. Um, I'm going to tell you to read Roseanne's book for more stories about what came to be known as the Jolly Trolleys. But I'll say here that um, back in the day, if you were going to Richmond on the trolley, you could have worked on your needlework, played poker or bridge with your friends, caught up on all the local gossip. And when the trolley crossed the Chickahominy River, as it's doing here, <laughs> prominent Hanover attorney Rosewell Page was famous for taking off his hat, raising his arms and shouting, all stand, we are in Hanover County, God bless her. <laughs> right there is where he did it. <laughs> but as much as Ashlanders loved their trolleys, they still didn't pay for themselves. In 1921, the Richmond Ashland Railway Company made a profit of $63. <laughs> they tried to raise revenue by raising the fares, then they tried lowering the fares, they sent out handbills appealing for more passengers, but in 1938, the company folded. If it had lasted until World War II, Booty Tucker Sr. said in 1986, it would be here today, but it didn't. The last trip of the Ashland Richmond trolley line must have been a wild one. McKinney says the last streetcar left Ashland at 11 p.m. on March 22nd, 1938, 
and that the car was loaded with nostalgic fans who removed souvenirs, shades, straps, bell cords from the car and from the Richmond passenger station. Then they returned to Ashland, whooping it up with a passenger at the controls. <laughs> Reporting the same shenanigans, the Herald Progress even named names. <laughs> Clyde Barnes is quoted as saying, we took the motor man and sent him to the back seat. <laughs> the Edwards boy was the motorman. Ann Sheenery drove the car and Billy Purrier manned the whistle. <laughs> Lord, I reckon it was 40 people in there hollering and shouting and drinking whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Evelyn Hughes reported that fire crackers exploded all the way back to Ashland <laughs> and that residents for miles were awakened by the whistle as it blew steadily for the last five minutes of the trip between Guathme and Ashland. As the cars pulled into the Ashland station, Ms. Hughes reported that all passengers were gathered in the aisle singing Old Lang Syne. <laughs> Soon after that, the property of the Ashen, uh, Richmond Ashland Railway Company was sold to a scrap metal dealer who took up all the rails, and somebody back there pick up the rail on that table, that, bo bo that uh, Woody. Two hands. It is so heavy. Um, anyway, they sold the rails, scrapped the streetcars, uh, sold the remaining scrap metal to Japan, and you've probably heard this story because this happened so close to the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Hanoverians speculated that their beloved trolley had been sold to Japan and thrown back at them in the form of shells and bullets. So that's the end of chapter two in the trolley line's history. I call that the streetcar chapter. Okay. Chapter three began in 1994, and where is Gisela Carson? She's in this picture, there she is. Uh, and Betty Lacey took it, so anyway. There are a lot of Betty's pictures in here. I th hope I've recognized all the people who contributed pictures. Um, it was designated a Greenway, 1994, and made part of Hanover County's park system. John Hodges, raise your hand, John. Barbara Nelson, I think I saw Barbara Nelson and Angie Lacombe, everybody remember Angie Lacombe? Spearheaded the effort. Angie was a town council member and worked as trails coordinator for the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Later, she was a volunteer for the Metro Richmond Greenway Committee, and her vision was a walking, biking, and horseback riding trail that would start at Carter Park, travel to Guathme, then go south through Elma, Lakeside, to the Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden. And when I worked there, we did not consider that a pipe dream. We thought it was coming any minute. Um, and then there was also the vision that it would go to Maymont from there. This is not dead. I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, somebody called me this morning, no, emailed me this morning from the Richmond Planning, Richmond Regional Planning Office. I wanted to know something about the trolley line and their seriously considering the extension to Lakeside, uh, to, yeah, Lakeside. And there's also uh, talk uh, about a green, the Greenway becoming part of a Washington to Richmond cycling trail. Um, today, let's see here, this is Stony Run, and I, I don't know why I can't see it, but those of you who walk it, is Linda Cole here? Yes, oh, that, that's, I'm sorry, okay. So Linda Cole, their, their bridge would be down here somewhere. They have the beautiful property to the, huh? The last link down there will cross the Cole Oh, uh, can you see it? Oh, is it up there? Okay. Anyway, they own the property to the east of the south end of the trolley line. Um, today, the town controls the part of the trolley line north of Stony Run. That's, remember, Stony Run goes under that big coal, culvert I showed you at first. Um, 
uh, the county controls the part of the trolley line south of Stony Run, and it's sort of important to know that because if there's something you want to complain about, you need to know which <laughs> side to complain to. And I complain pretty often. <laughs> the worst offender is Penline. It is a utility easement, and you know they have to do it. You know they have to do it, but there are ways to do it. Let me see, did I put, yes. Uh, this makes me absolutely crazy. I don't know the solution. These, you, bad pictures, but they, I keep thinking if you've got a cut, could you just sharpen your saw? Because <laughs> they j literally just, mangled. Um, my husband tells me it's not a matter of sharpening the saw, it's just a different kind of equipment, it can't help it, blah, 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 but um, when you complain it seems to be done better. <laughs> it really is, it, 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 and the cleanup part in particular. Okay, the most important event in Air Trail's recent history is that in 2016, the town of Ashland got a grant of over a million dollars to improve the trail by, among other things, constructing a boardwalk of precast concrete that will hug Maple Street on the east side, skirting the Walder property, or stable foundations, that's what that is now, skirting their property and gate. So, back to this. Here's where it would be. If you walk the trail, this gate is often locked. There it is. Some of us know that very well. So it's going to skirt that, and you'll be able to pick up. There's Giddy Up Lane. There's a, another little walk, right. paved walk there. So it's going to mean that you can get through here without trespassing. Uh, that this boardwalk is coming will be good news for those unnamed people who have been ignoring the no trespassing signs <laughs> for decades. <laughs> I don't know any of those people. Construction is set to begin this summer to be finished by winter. It's been held up because the power lines need to be raised higher. There will also be some asphalt paving at either end of the boardwalk. But to my enormous relief, that paving will not yet reach the current trolley line trail. And uh, that shows you uh, where, if anybody walks down there, that's what those pink uh, flags are showing. That's where the new boardwalk is coming. Um, I am, oh, I don't even know how to go into this, but I, I'm so hoping, or was so hoping, that it would not be paved, that it would not be turned into asphalt. I have, to me, there are two different things. A, there's a thoroughfare that you're trying to get through, or there's a path, and that's about being in it, not getting through it. I, my other argument was going to be that there are so many old people in the population and they're so much better on their old bones if it's not paved. However, I hate it when a fact gets in the way of a good argument. <laughs> uh, I looked up the uh, demographics of Ashland and 50% of the people in Ashland are under, 35 or under. <laughs> Only 15% are over 65. So there are probably more. <laughs> I know every single one of them's here. <laughs> That's so funny. So the point is that there are probably more people who need a place to cycle than who need a nice soft place to walk. However, um, I do. This is what you get on a path. This is the lumpy, infinitely interesting texture of a path. This is the texture of a an asphalt trail. I doubt seriously, given the population pressures in our area, that the Ashland Trolley Line Trail is going to remain the kind of path I have enjoyed for so long. But knowing this has made me think even harder about what's unique about the trail as I have experienced it for the past 21 years, because I want to make sure this history is remembered too. It also occurred to me when I was looking at these dates we had electric trains for 10 years, trolleys for 19 years, 
We've had the Greenway for 24 years. So its history is as important as what went before. So here are some things that are unique about it. It passes through an industrial area. This is what's now called stable foundations. Most old Ashland people call it the Walder property. Um, it's near the north end of the trail, closest to Ashland. There used to be tires and refrigerators and school buses. Raise your hand if you help clean that up. There are a lot of people in here who probably helped clean that up. It's in, it was horrid and it is now fine. And in fact, as I pass through all this now, I have come to enjoy the sculptural quality of all that stuff. It can be absolutely beautiful. Here it is again. And I want you to know this cost the city of Richmond $200,000. <laughs> it did. That is by a famous Colorado sculptor. And, we, and this, look what we have. This is, that looks like a nest. That is gorgeous. I love it. Anyway, we already have all that. OK. The trolley line is also notable for being so accessible and so close to neighborhoods. It is not a grand, pristine place or a wilderness area, but it is a relatively wild area where ordinary people can have regular contact with nature, and that is important. I think we can make a uh, that you can make a good argument that it makes as much sense to try to protect vacant lots and unmowed ditches as it does to save old growth forests because that's where most people get their experience with the wild. One of my favorite writers, Robert Michael Powell, once said, what is the extinction of a condor to a child who has never seen a wren? I'd also argue that regularly ride, walking the same route over and over has special value because it keeps you in touch with the rhythms of that particular piece of land. So here's what you might see if you were to walk the trolley line through the seasons. There's this, that's September. These are in October, November. Another September, that's interesting. Uh, another November. Okay. Um, now, oh, finally into the part that I feel most comfortable <laughs> with. <laughs> um, here are some of the things that you'd see if you walk the trail. The dominant trees, the loblolly pines are really, really nice. Tulip poplar, sweet gums, red maple, red oak, hickory, American holly, American beech, dogwood, persimmon, sassafras, all kinds of trees, wonderful trees. Um, the Hickory is particularly pretty and so underappreciated in Virginia. Some of you may have known Rami Harrington who said if you wanted to court a guy, take him in a car, or get, somehow get him out into a hickory woodland because hickory was better than candlelight for making you look beautiful. <laughs> hickory, hickory light, hickory light she always talked about. There's more hickory, sassafras, lots of sassafras. Beautiful tree, more sassafras, oak, that's a red oak, more oak with maple, lots of tulip poplars. And when they come through and mow, it's interesting, uh, they, tulip poplars, a lot of tulip poplars right on the edge. And it actually brings a lot of the interesting parts to the new growth of the tulip poplar right at eye level where you wouldn't ordinarily see it because they're so tall. So these stipules are one interesting thing about tulip poplar that you wouldn't see if they weren't chopping them down all the time. Uh, American holly, shrubs. I, th I think the shrubs to me are almost the most interesting part of the trolley line. Um, here's one particularly interesting one. Hercules club, anybody know? Aurelia spinosa. Okay, well let me, that's what the leaf looks like. It's often mistaken for uh, elderberry, or some people think it's a sumac, other parts of it. Terrible photo, but that's why it's called Hercules Club. It's the way the leaf stalks have this huge bulge at the bottom where it meets the stem. 
It's also called devil's walking stick. You see why? There it is looking like a uh, sumac, but it's not. It's a uh, Hercules club. That's a terrible picture, but I, I can say that when I took it. I can't say that about other people. That is, that's what the flower looks like. It's very interesting. Um, sum, uh, viburnum, beautiful viburnum along the trail. You know what? Who's that? I don't know who that is. I don't think so. I don't know. Who um, Betty took this picture, I think, didn't you, Betty? This is down on the part that is going to be impacted by the boardwalk. And I hope there's somebody here from the town, so I can say this publicly and somebody will hear me. Um, this sumac and uh, sassafras, that kind of thing, if you walk the High Line in New York City, the best landscape architects in the world have put in sumac and sassafras. We already have it. This is libel. I know you have to, if you're building a boardwalk, they're going to have to cut it down. But it would come back up from the roots if anybody has enough sense to just Not don't mulch roots. over it. Yeah. Don't try to put grass there. We have this, and it'll come back if, if it's allowed to come back. More sumac, in the, so pretty in the woods. Um, this, several kinds of sumac. We have this winged sumac, and we have smooth sumac. This is, and that's smooth sumac too. Um, this, I love this, I think this leaf was falling. It's out of focus, but I think it's falling. Uh, winterberry, lots of winterberry. Luckily, it's way off. It's off in a, a wetland area, luckily, or people would be picking it, I think. It, it's beautiful, there's more of that. Uh, the invasives, this is the, I think, probably a bigger threat. Paving would hurt the plants in the area less than these invasives are hurting them. If you take time to look at the sort of records that I've kept of the plants in the area, I can tell you we've lost, what we're losing plants to is the invasives, mostly Japanese honeysuckle. And somewhere in this room, somebody knows an Eagle Scout or a, somebody at the college who needs a community service project. This is doable to pull that uh, Japanese honeysuckle, English ivy, wisteria, a lot of bad things in there. This I didn't discover until I was looking at my slides. This, I loved this picture because it had the shadow that had been cast, you know, this, this is a cedar tree in the snow. It had cast a shadow, sort of, because the snow didn't hit the ground. That's why I like them. And then I went, uh-oh, that is an Asian bush honeysuckle. Very invasive, and one reason it does so well, look, this is November. It's still got its leaves on. It's the last thing to lose its leaves, first thing to get its leaves. You just, it's very hard to kill. So um, that's not a good thing there. Uh, the wildlife, I hope I put, oh, I didn't, shucks. I was, um, I wanted to show you, I think I put a slide in there somewhere showing you again the Walder Pond. I think I've got a slide in here later to show you again where it is. Is so uh, just lush with wildlife. Um, talk about the birds in a minute, but this, those that has downed trees in it and often the turtles are lined up like cars at a car wash. <laughs> you, the, the ten of them on a log and the, and the distant logs are full of them too. Oh, let's see, did I, that's totally given up on my notes here. Maybe I should look at them. <laughs> <laughs> the birds, uh, Linda Cole is our birding expert in Ashland. Her list of 123 species she has found on her property. Linda, is that still what it is? Did you hear that? She says it's 150 now. Um, some of the wonderful birds, you blue, uh, great blue heron down near that Walder Pond, see it almost every day. We have a bald eagle, we call the Elmont Eagle. 
all kinds of woodpeckers, uh, wood ducks, owls, and one of the best things in my entire life I have ever seen was on the trolley line looking about oh, at least 50 feet into the woods, way up in a tree, off, impossible to see. Linda Cole showed me a hummingbird nest. Oh, Big as a quarter in, oh, in, the, in the middle of the woods. Okay. Um, there it is. I wanted to show you this again because that pond, that is the equivalent of our Walden Pond. That is the, what we used to call the Walder Wetland, and it is so rich. Unfortunately, once this is built, you're not going to be able to get as close to it as you do now if you're trespassing. <laughs> but, so take your binoculars because this is so rich, you wouldn't believe it. Okay. That is another area. This is on the east side of the tracks. It's full of um, sort of snag trees, dead trees. And if you go with Linda Cole, it's full of birds. Mm -hmm. If you don't go with Linda Cole, there's nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The wildflowers, I do a better job over there of documenting those than I do here. But this is um, uh, partridge pea. Betty Lacey took this fun picture. This too, in that area that's about to be disturbed, Joe Pye weed, it'll come back if we let it. And this I love just as an example of st still discovering things. I walked down here with a friend who is a real plant person and she reached down and said, oh, that's anise, anise scented goldenrod. And sure enough, the leaf smelled exactly like anise. It's Solidago odora. It's so much fun. Learned that on November 2nd. I learned that. <laughs> uh, lots of mushrooms and things. My, Betty took this picture. OK, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be looking at that. I should be looking at this. Sorry. And lots of ferns, different, mostly Christmas fern. And this is a bracken fern. Bracken fern is very invasive, but in this setting, it's just fine. OK, this past November, I decided if I was going to make a serious effort to document the natural beauty of the Ashland Trolley Line Trail, I needed to bring in the pros. My own approach to record keeping, as you'll tell from those things scattered on the table, was helter skelter. I'm grateful for the records I have kept. A poor record is better than no record at all. But I have friends who are experts at this, and I invited three of them, all nature journalers, to spend two days with me documenting what was going on on the trolley line, November 1st and 2nd. Uh, this is Rhonda Roebuck, who is a wonderful nature journaler. There she is sitting on the trail working. This is uh, Rhonda drawing wahoo, or hearts of busting, which is one of the beautiful shrubs along the line. That's her product, which I absolutely love. It's over here. Do look at, I love it that it has the insects. Uh, oh, and here's the best thing. I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Remember this, my artifact, iron spike. Remember that. This is what uh, Betty Gatewood did. This is mostly uh, sumac and sassafras. Also, it's funny, she and I both paid attention to the bark of the um, loblolly pines. Loblolly pines love this area. A, a lot, you know what a loblolly is? It's a low area. I mean, that's what loblolly comes from. That's the word loblolly. And this one is mine. Um, this is, if you don't draw, this is a good way to do it. It's, it, you just use a grid and put all your little things and you never know what's gonna end up being historic. I put on mine, pork belly sandwich at the caboose. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, then there was this, the most unexpected discovery of our journaling experience. It's a piece of iron spike that Rhonda Roebuck discovered along the trail. I didn't believe it could be a spike at first. I, after all, had been walking this trail for over 20 years. <laughs> Rhonda had been on it for four hours when she found it. Betty Gatewood, who happens to be a park ranger, 
wears a compass on her wrist. <laughs> and to prove that it really was a spike, they took this to prove it was iron. It, it did make her compass go crazy. That night, we visited the Ashland Museum, which Roseanne opened, amazingly. And sure enough, it looked exactly like the, the iron. It's not the whole piece, but here's a spike. They're different from the spikes you find along the, yeah, tiny. let's send that around. That's anyway, so it was a spike. Um, to me, this was like catching the golden ring on the carousel because it's so connected, the trail's past to its present. This is what the trail looks like right now. Not very glamorous, but the red maples are in bloom, the path is awash in gumballs, and the sap is surging in the trees as I speak. If you visit, please look carefully and keep a record of what you see because number one, the trail really rewards close observation, and number two, next spring, it's going to be a different place. Even if the surface of the trail doesn't change for a while, and I hope it won't, there will be more cyclists, more pedestrians, more runners, more dogs, and just more users overall. I don't welcome this. But I realize the population of our town and county is growing, and this great space can't remain the private preserve of a few flam families forever. If there's any one message my research into the history of the trolley line has taught me, it is that things change. As I walk the trolley line today, oopsie, I can almost feel the pulse of passing trains under my boots. On winter nights, I can imagine sparks flying around those pantographs above the trolleys. I can almost hear the sound of that last long whistle from Gwathmi all the way to Ashland. These days, the trolley line is so quiet, the sound of my footsteps crunching on the frozen ground is enough to flush a dozen sparrows. But in my head, I can imagine the jolly trolley crowd carousing in this space. The mule teams groaning under their loads. The wide-eyed girls on their way to the opera. I know that someday I, my walks, and my memories will be just another chapter in the history of this special place, but that just makes the experience more valuable to me. <laughs> Take two hours. I, know. I was so afraid it was going to take two hours. <laughs>